introduce myself again. I'm Naveen. I'm a software architect at Pure Storage. I've been working a lot on the Cloud Block Store uh, product that we're announcing. And so I'm going to dig into the technical details of how we built Cloud Block Store. Later, I will be getting into maybe more forward thinking application integration. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully, this is the fun part of the talk. <laughs> so, as Kunal has really set the stage, we're looking for that consistency of experience between on premises and the cloud. And so, that tells us what we needed to do when we were setting out our design goals for Cloud Block Store. We're trying to build highly available, uh, predictable storage, but we also want our customers to be able to think about a single availability zone kind of like they would a physical data center. This is for that transitional period, as we've kind of been talking about. Uh, that means Cloud Block Store has to de deploy within a single AZ, so that was a constraint for us. In addition, uh, we want to retain all of the APIs and REST endpoints of the flash array, all of its capabilities and so on. So we've, we've done that. We also want to retain all of our data protection capabilities, such as snapshotting, replication, and so on. And then finally, one of our constraints was we want to be cost comparable to EBS, so to your other choices that are out there. So as we dig through this, hopefully that becomes clear. So as a brief refresher for folks that may not be familiar with a flash array, that, that's important to understand because it'll tell us what we're trying to build in uh, AWS. So a flash array is a dual controller architecture. That means if a single controller fails, the other controller is, is more than capable, capable of handling uh, all the application's IOs. In addition, an important aspect uh, is how writes, we'll go through writes and reads. So when a write IO comes into a flash array, it first lands in what we call our NVRAM. So we're gonna mirror that write to two NVRAMs before acknowledging it to the host. That means that the latency of writes is extremely crucial. We'll retain a copy of that write in the controller, so if a host were to read back that data immediately, we could service it from DRAM, so we actually don't worry about reads of the NVRAMs. The bulk of the storage of the flash array is in the flash modules, and so we destage data from the NVRAMs into our flash modules. We write at very high bandwidth. Latency is less important for the writes, but obviously that's where the majority of the storage is, and so if a host read were to hit the flash array, it's likely to hit that flash module. Read latency is extremely important. So that's the basic constraints of what we're looking for. And so when we went to go build something in AWS, we said, okay, well, let's just do the simple thing. Let's find things that are very similar to what we have on-prem. You can take two EC2 instances. That looks like two controllers. Maybe you can grab a mix of IO1 and GP2 to get something like the NVRAMs and flash module uh, characteristics you're looking for. But we quickly realized that wasn't going to work. And the first reason is that uh, EBS can only attach to a single EC2 instance. So our dual controller architecture that we're looking for, it's not going to make any sense because that second controller can't actually access any of the underlying storage. Another problem is that EBS doesn't let you specify placement in any way. So you can't say, you can't express that I want two EBS volumes and if the hardware for the first volume were to fail in some way, um, can you make it less likely that the second one's going to fail? It's not, there's not something you can, you can express, therefore RAID may not help in this, in this world. So that takes us to the architecture that we actually chose to build. I, I have a stupid question, but actually, <laughs> if your system uh -huh. is configured for dual path, okay, so you are Linux or whatever, and then you find that when you uh, get the copy that you send to the cloud and you find a system that is slightly different because it's a single controller system. But you have the asynchronous replica the synchronous replication somehow. Are, are you saying, so this, this is not what we built, is that? Sorry? We didn't actually build this. I'm saying this is, this is the architecture we chose not to build. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I, um, I missed the part. Sorry, I, I went a little too fast. We do want dual controller architecture. So this is what we did end up building. We went back to having two EC2 instances, just kind of like two, two controllers on our flash array. But we created something new that we call a virtual drive. So this, the backend storage for us is actually other EC2 instances. So we rat, wrote all new software for AWS. These virtual drives communicate with our controllers via, a purport, uh, via just standard networking. We have a proprietary protocol that provides something like multi-attach. So each controller can see all of the backend storage. We furthermore took those instances and we put them in a spread placement group. 
So a spread placement group, there's seven instances here within a single availability zone. The maximum width of a spread placement group is seven. What, what this gives us is that if the hardware for a single virtual drive, if a virtual drive fa fails because of some hardware failure, it's unlikely that another virtual drive will experience that same failure. So that gives us that. So each virtual drive is another EC2 instance? Yes. For NVRAM, we are attaching IO1 volumes to each of these EC2 instances. As we kind of set the stage a bit earlier, we only really need this for fast writes. So when a write comes into a cloud block store, it's mirrored to two NVRAMs before we acknowledge them to the host. IO1s give us that low latency profile that we're looking for. But we destage the data into S3. And we love S3 because it's extremely durable. So we're, that's where the bulk storage of cloud block store is. Uh, it's high bandwidth, so we can destage the NVRAMs really fast. But as we described earlier, if a host were to read data from cloud block store, it's likely going to be an S3. Unfortunately, S3's late read latency is rather high. So that doesn't quite solve our problem yet. And I think, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. <coughs> this looks more like Flash Array 1.0 architecture when you built the original design where you had the NVRAM in the disk shelf and not in the controller. And then you moved the NVRAM into the controller and took it away from the disk shelf, which obviously improved the performance. So are you really going slightly backwards with your architecture by using this design? Um, so I'd put it differently. I'd say that uh, things will evolve, and we'll get into that in a moment. But the way that I think of it is we've stepped into this kind of thinking of AWS almost as a hardware vendor, as a commodity hardware vendor, and we're looking at the best of breed that they have today in the cloud. And we're building a uh, tier one storage device out of that. So that causes us to make some trade-offs, but we believe new things will come down the pipe, and we are, we'll talk about that in a moment. We will totally, we'll completely incorporate them when they arrive. Okay, and just one other comment at the same time. On the very first slide, you didn't talk about um, performance as part of the, um, the requirements of building this. Uh, sorry, so I, I'd... It would be good to talk about the, the overhead of converting from what could be local NVMe devices to exposed iSCSI devices to other, other clients. Um, so performance is going to be workload dependent. We are trying to support the same workloads that our customers can support on-prem. Um, you're right that you, know, you shouldn't look at this as maybe being an X90 flash array. But uh, for workloads that you're running on-prem, you know, if you're moving them into AWS, we will completely help you size your workload for that. Um, it, it, performance is going to be more of a deep conversation, so maybe we can talk about that. But th we should be able to run the workload I think here. we should talk about it, because obviously it's irrelevant. I, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, so in one moment, hopefully we can dig yes. into that a second. <laughs> so we did establish right now that we already have high read latency, right? But that's not where we ended up. We ended up coupling uh, our instance, so the, the virtual machines, the, sorry, the EC2 instances that we're using are i3 instances. i3 is interesting because it has very large locally attached NVMe flash drives. We mirror all of the data that's destaged from NVRAM into both S3 and that instance store. So what that means is that every byte of data that's been destaged from NVRAM is extremely durable, it's in S3. It's also extremely fast to read because it's in locally attached NVMe flash. So the read latency is very low. Is that, are we? <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry. You, so you, the, need, so you need uh, all these instances. Uh, it, it looks very expensive, I mean, from, from the outside. It turns out to be pretty interesting that uh, I3 instances, so there's a couple aspects to this. Um, one is, Kunal already mentioned data reduction, right? So for every, let's say, byte of data that you're housing in cloud blocks, we are requesting a fraction of that uh, on the back end storage, right? That's, that's for the actual data that you've written. There's, of course, thin provisioning that you can kind of add on to that. The second thing is that I3 instances, and as we look forward, I3 EN instances, if you actually do the pricing for dollar per gig, it actually is, uh, Assuming that you, you know, we're assuming that our customers are going to want these things to be persistent. So, at at your contract rates, you're going to it's you're going to see that's competitive with EBS, and then with I3EN, it actually is quite a bit cheaper. 
Okay. So it's surprising that you get a very fast product for actually uh, a lower cost, depending on how you're procuring it. Uh, uh, but in this case, we're all completely within a VPC, the customer's VPC, within their AZ. So there should be no cross. Actually, that's part of the reason why we chose to live within their AZ, is we didn't want them to have to pay cross AZ charges or cross VPC charges. Right, so durability within the AZ means that I don't need to be re writing redundant copies in the next AZ and paying a, a penny per gigabyte, right? That can kill you at high bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, Isn't well, there a risk in this architecture that it's not replicable on other clouds? Because that, that's, uh, you know, you're, you're using components, some of them that yep. are very, very AWS. So I, I think the right way to think of it is we are not porting our software into each cloud. We are building a uh, flash ray light like experience. I mean, we'll call it Cloud Block Store in each cloud. And then when we look at AWS and when we look at Azure, we think of them as almost like different hardware vendors. They have different components. Okay. We 100% have to build things differently. So, you know, so the backend will be built differently. Sorry, I'm Your backend will be built differently. Exactly. That's not. Pure's got some experience doing that just based on conversations we've had pure previously about the internal hardware choices so that you could get different TikTok schedules out of the um, silicon manufacturers, uh, sorry, out of the flash manufacturers and not be beholden to a particular flash foundry, for example. It's, this feels very similar. That's right. And, and by the way, I mean, it may, there may be a future in which Cloud Block Store doesn't have virtual drives. We'll talk about upgrade in a moment. We 100% embrace that future. We, we went with the best choices we could make today. One year from now, two years from now, we may make different choices. So from a couple of questions, I, I, I can see how upgrades or storage expansion becomes simpler because the underlying pieces are EC2 instances. Mm -hmm. uh, the controllers, what, what size are the controllers? Um, so the, the GA version of uh, Club Block Store, they are uh, C5N 9X large is one choice. So or C5N. networking heavy. Yes, What's that? Networking. Absolutely, yes. yes. Okay. So Nitro is, we love Nitro. Mm -hmm. uh, we love the, where uh, AWS is going in terms of network bandwidth. Uh, we see that as being, uh, that's essentially the train we're trying to, to catch, if that makes sense. What's the purpose of the read instance, or the instance store? Uh, every byte that is in S3 is also in an instance store which means that when you're servicing reads to the host, they're actually always being serviced from instance store. And why is it non-persistent if every byte of the S3 data store is in the instance store? Um, what do you mean by it's non-persistent? It's non the nature of there. instance store. Oh, uh, I see. Um, we'll, <laughs> the next slide hopefully will address that. Okay. Any other questions on? Hey, S3 is durable, but they're not. I could shoot one of them and then exactly. create a new one, and it'll bring the ring. Come on, that's my next slide. Yeah. <laughs> call it non-persistent? Right. I mean, get to the next oh, slide. Sorry, slide. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, Battery-backed, it's RAM. All right. Okay. <laughs> so this architecture is really meant to design uh, failure within an AC. memory non-persistent. So in yeah. SSDs are persistent. So they're persistent right, until right. So they're persistent. So they're per instant store by definition is erased when the EC2 instance is stopped. Yep. It's local SSD inside the hypervisor host. So it's a local it, NVMe SSD out. in this case. Yeah, right. It's always erased when the instance stops. I got you. It's an AWS. Yes, sorry. Yeah. I forgot to AWS that. The data may pure. still be there, but the encryption keys have been deleted so that I can't I understand. Spin up a new instance and suddenly I've got access to I've all of there. your data. I, I understand. I apologize. I'm, I'm used to all of the decoding ring uh, pieces of AWS. So in this fault tolerant context and its ability to survive within an AZ, could it have suffered and survived during the USC outage? Um, okay if the answer is no. Yes. I want to accept that. Yes. <laughs> no, it, it, it is designed to tolerate any, it, the loss of the entire AZ. Um, we would have to then recover from the combination of the S3 and I01 volumes that have mm -hmm. been kind of distributed. Is it, so, is, if the SSDs are non persistent, then the IO NVRAM is also non persistent? Uh, well, I01 does have a contract of they uh, will retain the data, right? And we've done it in such a way that it's mirrored and. Just check. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's fun, actually. Uh, but. So these spread placement groups that I was describing, we also are using auto-scaling groups. 
And so if you're unfamiliar with auto scaling groups, you can basically say how many instances are expected to be there. In this case, we'll say seven of seven are expected to be there. If an instance were to fail, the auto scaling group will go ahead and replace that instance. Then our software will kick in. It will use S3 to restore all of the data of that instance back into the instance store. And that, that virtual drive will represent itself back to cloud block store as if it had never been removed in the first place. So, and in terms of the controllers at the very top, are they stateless like they were in the original flash array? Are they, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Are, they, are the controllers at the very top, are they stateless like they were in the very original? Yes, function? absolutely. So does that mean you could potentially scale those out and build a scale out architecture using this solution? <laughs> Um, <laughs> you can scale out the scale out. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> mad man. I think the short answer is no. We we that is not the path we are pursuing here. Okay. So it's not like a there's no raid across the virtual drives or anything like that. We actually do, and the reason is because during that loss of an of a virtual drive, we want host I/O to be unaffected. So we can do what we call read by reconstruct during that period. But the IO1 data is persistent and it's available. So it's a, it's a write buffer for all the data. And, mm -hmm. and the, the non-persistent instance store is duplicated on, on the S3. Correct. So we could read it from the S3 directly in the case. Are you saying during you, this? Rather than reading it from the S3, you're reading it from the other virtual drives, reconstruct? Well, the latency of S3, first time to first byte is 100 to 150 milliseconds. Time to first byte of an instance store is a fraction of a millisecond. So we don't want our application, the host application, to be experiencing this large cliff just because an instance failed. No, but I, oh. I think the question when you're asking about rebuild too, right? So we are rebuilding from S3 because that is very, you know, throughput. Uh, we have a lot of throughput there, right? So we're able to rebuild from S3. I, I think I understand what you're doing. I, I understand that it's okay. much more accessible from yeah. virtual drives, speed-wise, than S3. So if you're going to rebuild this. Oh, one. sorry. Uh, the rebuild, I, I, I hadn't built my, out my slide. Uh, <laughs> that's what yeah, I was yeah, talking yeah. about. So the data for this instance store is, re is just read back from S3. But there's that period where it's not there yet or it hasn't completed oh, that okay. process. So this is during the time prior to physically having rebuilt yeah, the instance. Exactly. Or yes. We want to cover that on yet. the fly from the IO1 buffer that's sitting out there? It would be from the other instance store. Uh, so when you do a write, how many of the virtual drives are you writing to? Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of a host write, we are going to be writing to two IO1s to mirror. But then we will destage from that and then essentially do a striped write to the instance store and the S3s. OK. So what's the you know, RTTN on ACK? RTTN. Round trip time. Oh, uh, oh sorry, for, from <laughs> <laughs> software guy. Uh, you're, you're saying for the host? For yeah. yeah, it's the host. Um, you can think of it as we're going to add uh, roughly half a millisecond to the underlying uh, AWS infrastructure. Okay. So what keeps the state of my configuration for my controllers? I'm sorry, can you say that again? What the keeps the configuration state of my contr controllers? Ah, so there was a piece that I didn't get into because I didn't know how deep we're going to go. We also <laughs> use... Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we go all the way. <laughs> we also use DynamoDB. So uh, DynamoDB is kind of retaining the... There's two aspects of it, actually. There's the CloudFormation template itself. We use it in interesting ways. So we, we deployed this whole stack using one CloudFormation template. We are constantly reading that to say, OK, well, that was the state that we thought we were born as. And then there's DynamoDB on the side, where we're kind of reconciling the current state of the universe with. So as I'm clicking and changing stuff in my configuration, that doesn't necessarily update the CloudFormation, the DynamoDB. So if I need to re instantiate my cluster of uh, controllers, if both go down and I boot them back up from my cloud formation, the DynamoDB then lays the, the latest, the, the last known good state on top of that. Um, in, a, in the case of an AZ failure, yes, so you'd have to actually do, um, it would be a non-standard cloud formation deployment. Like, so you're not deploying in that new array, you're kind of right. saying, please go use the stuff that's already been there. And we have internal fields to kind of handle that case. So if I shut down, if I, this is a test dev and I test shut down 
my cloud formation is updated for the, like how do I, when I go to power it back up? Um, yes, I think that would actually be a new, de new cloud formation deployment. Why would you shut down? I'm just confused. But yeah, yeah, why I would I shut word. down my storage array? <laughs> you got to reboot the storage array. That's not really something we support at GA. Yeah, I was practice. just going to point that out. Uh, that we don't support like you know <laughs> shutting down instances. But it's, we are looking at doing that in a exactly. much more effective way in the future, uh, where we know we can make it a lot more flexible how people spin up and down. But we won't. We're not supporting that in version one. So I guess the resizing is a is a, is a factor. So let's say that I have, I'm doing test dev. Mm -hmm. and, or I'm doing analytics. I want to, you know, this is a great platform to do analytics. I'm going to take a snap of my uh, SAP data warehouse, put it up here, do some analytics. Done with the analytics. I want to keep the storage array state up, but I don't need that, that, that 18 terabytes of storage anymore. How do I have an elastic uh, array where I go back down in size? Yeah, no, and, and that's why I said, you know, we don't have that version one, but okay. absolutely that's something high priority for us to look at, like how can we allow for that use case where you can just get, basically get rid of it. So in, as, uh, sorry, as an alternative, you too, could do a cloud snap, just like we talked about before, cloud snap, and then, you know, blow away that uh, cloud box store and then restore, you know. Well, the, the great thing is this is cloud formation, so while, if you guys don't support it, that's irrelevant, I can just build it. The, it, I, I can, I can, if I'm in AWS, I can build this. Yeah. So we would, I just we would ask to, we would ask for you to wait until we tell you how to do it, though. But um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I break things fast. <laughs> so in a physical array, you have control on all the paths, including you know the connection between the controller and the and the and the disks. But actually, here you use TCP/IP in the backend. Correct. From AWS, which Correct. is pretty unstable. I mean. Uh, you, you don't get very, very consistent performance all the way. So what happens if one of these instances is uh, slower than the others? Uh, that's another case where RAID can help us. So we, we actually use timeout values to determine whether or not we should go ahead and just read the data from other places. Um, in the case of writing, we actually can choose different mirror locations. Right? So we always have flexibility in where we can kind of read and where we can write. And if uh, the problem can write is out. somehow persistent, can, can you replace the, the virtual disk? Um, if we, you mean if, if we find that one of them is misbehaving? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yes, we can. I think the idea would be that our software should be responsible for detecting that and replacing it for you. Is it? Is um, it? You know, can I just interrupt? Like, we're way behind. Yes. We have, uh, I know this is a great conversation, I'm loving it. Is it but likely, we're like, we have a lot of. one question. Is it very likely that only one of the virtual drive instances will go down and not four or five of the other ones? I mean, how is it likely that one EC2 instance of the seven gifted primary virtual drive data volumes that exist in the whole world for my data will go down? So, uh, in the case of. Spread placement, the contract that AWS is giving you is that these instances are on separate physical hardware. They also have separate they are hardware yeah. separate. They're separate yeah. network so a fault domain. Tower, fault zones kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. spread placement is providing that. Yeah. Oh, I got you. And the availability for the individual instance is only four nines. Right. right. And so and that's uh that's, that's AMS, AWS best practices yeah. for getting no, I'm, uh, I'm good. I, yeah. Yeah. So, there. Is yeah. Cloud Black Store in, uh, visible and accessible in your Pure One console? Just yes. like the rest mm -hmm. of the stuff? Yes, Absolutely. it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, at GA yeah, or, or today, et cetera? It, it, It'll be supported at GA. GA. So it's a, if pure one, you can see all your flash arrays and cloud blocks to instances, Perfect. yeah? All right, I'm going to speed up. Uh, I do want to, another aspect of fault tolerance is software upgrade. So cloud block store uh, deploys with purity version 5.3. Our, so our customers are invariably going to want software from purity version 5.4. Software upgrade, non-disruptive upgrade, is core to how we build things at Pure, and it's very much like handling fall, uh, failure, right? We're essentially you guys are handling the upgrades anyway, so it doesn't really matter. It's it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly. I, like that. I love that. <laughs> but but uh, the point is that we are going to rolling upgrade the cloud block store array so that the host is unaffected, and we'll bring you up to the newer version. That's also what we view as evergreen in the cloud. So just like hardware is constantly evolving on our physical flash array, Amazon and other cloud vendors are constantly. Uh, providing new instance types, new storage types, new storage classes. We are always looking at those. We will evolve the cloud block store to take advantage of 
better performance, better cost profiles, whatever. The point is that the customer application should be unaffected. Your application should continue operating as we evolve uh, your array. Focusing non-disruptive upgrades on AWS for, for Evergreen in the cloud. Uh, I think we're saying that we will choose, uh, as, as types evolve, we will make choices that allow us to do that. Mm. Can you take the Kubernetes service? I, as an engineer up here, I'm not allowed to release a product that can't do that. So, Great idea. Yeah. Constraint. Evergreen. No, but I think you know, the way it gets enabled is because oh, of you know, we have the redundancy built into every layer. And we can change the controller types, uh, instance types, the actual uh, virtual shell, any of that, you know, we can change that. Even like IO ones, you know, we can in the future look at, you know, uh, GP two. So there are many, many, many uh, options we can explore. So now, uh, moving on towards kind of where we're looking in terms of application integration for Cloud Block Store. Can I ask one question before absolutely, that? Absolutely. Are you it's in the opening slide? You said price comparable. Are you going to have any pricing conversations at any point? Uh, or so if not, no, and, okay. No, no, and comparable. No, and as I said, you know, the commercialization thing is such an you know big discussion. I, what I will propose is, you know, we've tried to pack in pack in a lot of content. Post this session, you know, I'd be happy to sit down. You know, Van and I can sit down and we can work through like you know what are the different pricing comparisons we have. Uh, I talked a little bit about like you know how customers would pay for Cloud Block Store, but what does it compare? I think you're talking about native EBS. How does it compare? We can absolutely it's talk about that. All, all across the board. But it's really exciting that we can actually run this inside of Kubernetes as a sub instance inside of our container. Oh, right? someone's oh. going to go there. Uh, uh, that's, someone that, was going to go. There. That we're, <laughs> we're going so slowly. Scale different. it across yeah, itself yeah, go into it, <laughs> and then we can containerize that. I love it. It's, There's uh, a project for that. <laughs> <laughs> that that opens up the multiverse. Oh. So we don't want to do that. Uh, so the uh, what what I do want to step back now and talk a little bit about applications and and where we're going there. We've talked a lot about storage consistency. I think from our perspective, and we also talked about virtualized environments. For containerized applications, we view Kubernetes and container orchestration as the way that you get, get that consistency of application experience across different uh, clouds or across your physical data center in the cloud. That's great for stateless applications, but for stateful, we have Pure Service Orchestrator, which is a software layer that kind of marries the two, such that if you have a stateful application running on-prem, you can take that application template, migrate the data to the cloud, and deploy that same template, and Pure Service Orchestrator is responsible for keeping track of that configuration so that the same application can deploy into both locations. And that gives you that portable, sort of seamless um, uh, capability that our, our customers really are asking for. So this is, this is kind of the more future-looking part of uh, our presentation. To give you an idea of how Pure Service Orchestrator works, by the way, it is GA. Pure Service Orchestrator exists. It is supported on Cloud Block Store as well. It reaches up into the Container Orchestrator as a plugin. When a container requests a volume, it will work with Pure Service Orchestrator to go find a array to deploy that volume onto, to create it, connect it up to the actual physical node running the container, and handle all the SAN configuration. And so what that means is to the actual container developer, they're just making a persistent volume claim and it's being satisfied by Pure Service Orchestrator. So it gives you a pure, an actual volume as a service capability to the developer. How do I address that? I'm mostly thinking from the Docker volume plugin, I'm a bit more familiar with it than Flexful. Um, so as a, as a developer, when I, I write my YAML, generally, um, to say this is what I want to do, what what level of specification do I need to provide? To you'd you'd be all that. You would create a storage class, okay. or you would basically say we have a pure storage storage class, or you can make that the default storage class, and then when you make a persistent volume claim, it's satisfied. Okay, by us. <clears throat> but we've talked a lot about fault tolerance for cloud block store. It's important to note that Kubernetes does a lot of that for the application layer. So in this example, I have a pod three. It's running on some node. If that pod were to fail, it's Kubernetes' responsibility to go and redeploy that uh, pod onto some other node and, and maintain the application. However, that node may not have failed. It may actually be undergoing a network partition. 
And in this case, we have a stateful application. It's, it's attached to a pers persistent volume three. It may still be able to talk to that volume. So what Pure Service Orchestrator does is it works in conjunction with Kubernetes to preempt access to that volume before providing it to the new pod, new, newly deployed location of the pod. And by doing that, we're working hand, -to -hand, with, hand in hand with Kubernetes so that you have data integrity for uh, enterprise applications running in containers. Another capability that that gives us is the ability to manage your fleet. So the pure service orchestrator is aware of all of the arrays in the customer environment. You, when you request a volume, it can decide which one to actually create that volume on. Sort of a fleet management capability almost. But now that Cloud Block Store is all software, some of the things we're thinking about is maybe we could actually manage your Cloud Block Store for you. Maybe in this types of, type of environment, we could go actually deploy one for you. So maybe all of that becomes just the job of the orchestration environment uh, looking forward. So that, that hopefully gives you an idea of where we want to evolve the application you ecosystem. Say we, to. we <laughs> being the pure service orchestrator, or we being pure storage is going and managing the stuff within the orchestrator. Um, I mean the the pure service orchestrator. Let's say some software layer, not not a human. I don't know if that's what you meant. That that, that yeah, I just wanted to confirm. That. Yeah. <laughs> no, because sometimes it's like we can do this, no, no. and now we've got a. Uh, to be clear, we can't do this today. I'm just trying to. This is the forward looking aspect, right? This is where we already have pieces of orchestration in customer mm -hmm. environments. It's software. We've built f software infrastructure. It's not, doesn't seem within, beyond reason to say that our orchestration layer can manage that software. And so as far as the long-term vision around the Elastic Scaling, the Pure service, or service Orchestrator, if you're using AKS or EKS or PKS or GKE or fill in blank of whatever other letters you want to use, does it not care because they all kind of are a little crappy working among themselves, let alone trying to trying to scale across each, you know, oh, you need to type this command for that. It's like the same damn command. Uh, yeah, so there, there, there are always going to be slight issues there. So, I mean, uh, the way you express your application might differ between those, so that we can't solve. Mm -hmm. But from the storage layer perspective, in terms of persistent volumes and so on, that pers from that layer onward, yes, we are consistent. Um, and we integrate with many of the orchestration, uh, uh, container orchestration environments out there. Uh, up here are both ones that we support or ones that we are looking to support. Uh, and that's, that's also the idea that I'm, I want to give mm -hmm. you is that it doesn't really matter what container, uh, container orchestration environment you're looking at, we're probably also looking at it. It's hopeful that the APIs haven't changed between versions, and they have. Yes, and so uh, we all, I think now we can, we should probably take that offline and talk yeah. more philosophically, but I think the industry has to resolve a lot of those problems. They won't. But, but, <laughs> but from okay. a, yeah, no from a yeah. develop. I hope that answers the question. The value part, right? You know, we talked about test dev, the cloud snappies, and the containers. You know, where we can really add value from how we can kind of scale from on-prem to the cloud or be it only in the cloud. I hope that that, this is more compelling. I, yeah. I would like to see a bit more of this front-ended in that in the yeah. other slides mm -hmm. because sure. it feels, it depends on your audience. Right. So for a lot of enterprises, it, it is a bridging conversation. Yeah. And they're talking about where they are today and most people aren't doing containers. Right. They just, they just aren't. Yeah. Um, and it's going to take us a decade. Yeah. Yep. So hopefully some of the yeah. APIs. Well, and, 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 and you're spot on the, on that. You know, and that's for why the Kubernetes crowd, that's, uh, what's your Twitter handle? Actually, so regarding that point, I do want to leave one, uh, make one statement, which is, oops, sorry, I went too far. Uh, since FlashRay already supports Pure Service Orchestrator today, one of the other ways that customers can migrate into the future is by, all right, you've already got a FlashRay. Convert your applications now. Containerize them. And then when you're ready, move. It'll work. You make it sound that's like that's you, John. Well, no, but I meant, but I meant <laughs> yes. the reason you why. It's easy. I, I agreed. But, but, I th <laughs> but I think what's even harder is saying I have to both move into the cloud and make choices at the same time. And what I'm saying is like maybe. Yes, you do. Yeah. I, so. Okay. Well, that separate yeah. discussion. Yeah. Conway's yeah. law tells me yes, you need to. Um, 
and we've seen what happens when people don't. So that yeah. I'm always wary of the lift and shift to cloud thing yeah. because it's like, sure. yes, for fabulous. We're still good. It's running COBOL on mainframes, <laughs> but now they're virtual mainframes. Yeah. So, you know, this, but, that, but just to be clear, what I meant was, I, I, what I'm saying is, think think in terms of how you want to deploy in the cloud, like containerize. Absolutely, yeah. that's one option, right? What I'm saying is, you don't actually have to move to do it. Do it on the existing infrastructure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Validate it. Yes. And then just switch it. And that, right, that, that is actually far more compelling than you have to go into cloud to do this. It's, it's exactly. Cloud is not a location, it's a state of mind. Exactly. Yes. A way of doing things. Yeah. And, and we want if, if you can bring that, so that's that's the whole thing of, well, actually what we're doing is not taking on-site and moving it to cloud. We're taking cloud ideas and bringing them on-site. That's good. And right changing right. the way you run your IT. Huh? That And that's what yep. a lot of organizations, I think, are wrestling with and starting to come to that conclusion yeah. in the same way they did with, we want to do agile yeah. software development like the cloud people do yeah. because we see the benefits for it. Right. Not for everything, yeah. but certainly for new stuff. Yeah, yeah.